If you haven't looked at the title of this episode yet, let me give you a little quiz of your musical knowledge to help introduce today's topic. What do these things have in common? The Pretender's Brass, Perry Como's Falling Star, Natasha Bedingfield's Sunshine, Alanis Morissette's Hand, and P. Money's Cash? They're all kept in the subject of this episode. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind Pockets. But first, a quick message. I have a side project I'm working on called Podcast Share. This is a Twitter account maintained by a different podcast listener every week for them to kind of live tweet what podcast they're listening to. You can follow the account at Podcast Share on Twitter. And I'm super excited to announce this will be launching on International Podcast Day on September 30th. And I've already started scheduling curators for the coming weeks. Find out more information or nominate a curator at podcastshare.net. Do you ever wonder why women's pockets are usually much smaller than men's? This was actually how pockets began. Men had pockets sewn into their breeches, vests, or overcoats as far back as the 17th century. But if a woman wanted a place to keep her belongings safe while traveling outside the house, she had to have special pouches tied with a ribbon underneath all those layers of skirts and petticoats. To get to those, she would need to lift up all the layers and, oh, possibly show her ankles, But since it was rare for a woman to be the money keeper back then, what did she keep in her pockets? It seems these weren't necessarily the small pockets we know today, since they were known to keep pin cushions and sewing supplies, snuff boxes, which are small ornamental boxes, smelling bottles, since fainting was a common occurrence, and even cakes and bonbons. It became common for slits to be cut in skirts for women to be able to access these pouches easily, But thanks to Marie Antoinette popularizing the slimmer Grecian cut dresses, the fashion of big skirts and dresses declined, taking pockets with them in favor of a slimmer silhouette. And that's when outside purses were introduced, and the fad hasn't gone away. As clothing with pockets increased, you can imagine the number of pickpockets did as well. From the artful Dodger in Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist picking pockets in a time when young boys caught doing so could be a one-way ticket to the gallows, to an illusion master today who is billed as a theatrical pickpocket known as Apollo Robbins, who famously stole everything except the guns from Jimmy Carter's Secret Service detail back in 2001. And that includes the president's top-secret itinerary and the keys to the motorcade. Harry Houdini even wrote a book in 1906 called The Right Way to Do Wrong, with a section about various ways pickpockets are able to accomplish their crimes. Sometimes a small and very sharp knife is used to cut the sides of the dress or pantaloons of the victim so that the purse may be abstracted without going into the pocket directly. Others of this light-fingered gentry wear light overcoats with large pockets removed. They will endeavor to stand near a person, preferably a woman, who is paying her fare and has displayed a well-filled purse. The pickpocket then carelessly throws his coat over her dress and by inserting his hand through the outside opening of his own coat, quietly proceeds to abstract her purse. Now, if you're thinking you probably don't have to worry about anyone slashing your pantaloons, more modern ways to pickpocket rely mostly on diverting attention such as using an accomplice to distract the victim, known as the mark, while the pickpocket has a seemingly valid excuse to get close to them, like the sandwich technique, for example. This is when an accomplice walks in front of the mark while the pickpocket walks behind both of them. When the accomplice stops short, inevitably the mark crashes into them, with the pickpocket then crashing into the mark, having an excuse to get close enough to them to grab the contents out of their backpack, purse, or back pockets with just a quick sleight of hand. Luckily, pickpocketing has been on the decline for the last half century, at least in America, and mandatory schooling kept would-be thieving children off the streets. But busy tourist destinations are still some of the most popular spots for pickpockets. My coworker came to work on Monday wearing this new dress, and it was adorably bright and cheerful, and she received a ton of compliments on it. And to those compliments, her response was always, thank you, it has pockets. 
And you may have seen the internet memes making fun of this, but as a woman, I can tell you, we really do get excited when our dresses come with pockets. My wedding dress had pockets, actually. And whenever anybody asks about my wedding, that's one of the first things I tell them. If you're a male, you may not realize just how little pocket space we have. Sometimes we may buy a pair of slacks only to find out the pockets are fake or sewn closed. And this goes back to that silhouette Marie Antoinette popularized. Since pockets are usually placed on the hips, the fashion industry, and women trying to emulate the models on the runway, shy away from adding any more bulk to that area. But with more gadgets we want to carry around with us, especially brand new phone models, the demand for pockets has increased. And as a personal plea, would it be so much to ask for cargo pants to make a comeback? But then again, purse makers have a lot to gain from the fashion industry, taking its time adding more functional pockets to women's clothing. I even joked with my coworker about this as we were talking about her dress, and we decided to rally against the purse industry, or Big Prada as we're now calling it. The role of Harry Houdini was played by Brian Earle from the podcast Illusion. Information for this episode was sourced from Mike.com, The Atlantic, The Victoria and Albert Museum, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. This episode was brought to you by the Story Behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash thestorybehind. Stargate Pioneer from gunnageek.com, Matt from the One Word Go Show, Linguist Sam, Diane from History Goes Bump, Scott Smith from Recovering from Religion, Dan Brennick from Netflix and Swill, Jared Dunham from thehistoryfile.net, Heather Welch from Sunshine and Power Cuts, Jason Bryant from Matt Talk Online, and newest executive producer, Two Peas on a Podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>